from the complete visions of and Catherine Emmerich. At the end, a prayer for the intercession of blessed and Catherine Emmerich. When the kings received the news of Jesus' arrival, they made great preparations for his reception. Trees were bound together so as to form covered walks, and triumphal arches erected. These latter were adorned with flowers, fruits, ornaments of all kinds, and hung with tapestry. Seven men in white, gold-embroidered mantles, long and training, and with turbans on their heads ornamented with gold and high tufts of feathers, were dispatched to the pastoral region to meet Jesus and bear to him a welcome. Jesus delivered in their presence an instruction in which he spoke of right-minded pagans who, though ignorant, were devout of heart. The dwelling place of the kings was so commodious and so rich in ornamentation that words cannot describe it. It was more like a delightful pleasure garden than a real tent city. The principal tent looked like a large castle. It consisted of several stories raised upon a stone foundation. The lowest was formed of railings through which the eye could penetrate, and the upper ones contained the various apartments, while all around the immense building ran covered galleries and flights of steps. Similar tent castles stood around, all connected together by walks paved with colored stones ornamented with representations of stars, flowers, and similar devices. These walks, so clean and beautiful, were bordered on either side by grass plots and gardens whose beds, regularly laid out, were full of flowers, slender trees with fine leaves such as the myrtle and dwarf laurel, and all kinds of berries and aromatic plants. In the center of the city, upon a grassy mound such as described, rose a very high and beautiful fountain of many jets. It was surmounted by a roof supported on an open colonnade around which were placed benches and other seats. The streams from the jets shot far around the central column. Back of this stood the temple, with its surrounding colonnades, containing the vaults of the kings, among which was the tomb of King Seer. This temple was open on one side, but closed on the others by the doors leading to the vaults. It was in shape a four-cornered pyramid, but the roof was not so flat as those that I saw on the early part of the Lord's journey. Spiral steps with railings ran up around the pyramid, whose summit was executed in open work. I noticed also a tent house in one side of which youths were being educated, and on the other, but entirely separate, girls were instructed in various branches. The dwellings of the females were all together and outside of this enclosure. They lived entirely separate from the men. Words cannot say with what elegance the whole city was laid out, and with what care it was preserved in its beauty, freshness, and neatness. The buildings presented an airy appearance characterized by simplicity of taste. Beautiful gardens with seats for resting were everywhere to be met. I saw an immense cage, more like a large house than a cage, filled from top to bottom with birds. Further on, I saw tents and huts in which dwelt smiths and other workmen. I saw also stables and immense meadows full of herds of camels, asses, great sheep with fine wool, also cows with small heads and large horns, very different from those of our country. I saw no mountain in this region, only gently rising hills, not much higher than our pagan sepulchral mounds. Down through these hills, through pipes inserted for that purpose, borings were made in search of gold. If the boring tube were brought up with gold on its point, the mine was opened in the side of the hill, and the gold dug out. It was then smelted in the neighborhood of the mine in furnaces heated not with wood, but with lumps of something brown and clear, which too was dug out of the earth. Menser, who was under the persuasion that it was only an envoy from Jesus who had arrived, set all in motion to give him as solemn a reception as if it were the king of the Jews himself who had come. He deliberated with the other chiefs and priests, and prescribed the various details of his reception. Festal garments and presents were prepared, and the roads by which he was to come magnificently decorated. All was carried forward with joyous earnestness. Menser, mounted on a richly caparisoned camel which was laden on both sides with small chests, and attended by a retinue of twenty distinguished personages, some of whom had formed part of the caravan to Bethlehem, set out to meet Jesus who, with the three youths and seven messengers, was on his way to the tent castle, Menser's party chanted, as they went along, a solemn, plaintive melody such as they had nightly sung during their journey to Bethlehem. Menser, the eldest of the kings, he of the brownish complexion, wore a high, round cap ornamented with some kind of a white puffed border, and a white training mantle embroidered in gold. 
As a mark of honor, a standard floated at the head of the procession. It looked like a horse's tail fastened to a pole, the top of which was indented with points. The way led through an avenue across lovely meadows carpeted here and there with patches of tender white moss that glanced like dense fungus in the rays of the sun. At last, the procession reached a well covered by a verdant temple of artistically cut foliage. Here Mensa dismounted from his camel and awaited the Lord, who was seen approaching. One of the seven delegated to escort Jesus ran on before and announced his coming. The chests borne by the camels were now opened, and magnificent garments embroidered in gold, golden cups, plates, and dishes of fruit were taken out and deposited upon the carpet that was spread near the well. Menser, bowed with age, supported by two of his retinue and attended by his train-bearer, went to meet Jesus. His whole demeanor was marked by humility. He carried in his right hand a long staff ornamented with gold and terminating in a scepter-shaped point. At a glance from Jesus he experienced, as formerly at the crib, an interior monition similar to that which had drawn him, first of the three, down upon his knees. Reaching his staff to Jesus, he now prostrated again before him, but Jesus raised him from the ground. Then the old man ordered the gifts to be brought forward and presented to Jesus, who handed them to the disciples, and they were replaced upon the camel. Jesus did indeed accept the splendid garments, though he would not consent to wear them. The camel likewise was presented to him by the old man, but Jesus thanked without accepting. They now entered the bower. Mensa presented to the Lord fresh water into which he had poured some kind of juice from a small flask, and fruit on little dishes. In a manner inexpressibly humble, childlike, and friendly, Mensa questioned Jesus about the King of the Jews, for he still looked upon him as an envoy, though he could not explain to himself his inward emotion. His companions conversed with the youths and wept for joy when they heard from Aramensier that he was the son of one of those followers of the kings that had remained behind and settled near Bethlehem. He was a descendant of Abraham by his second wife, Keturah. Mensa wanted Jesus to ride upon his camel when they were again starting for the tent castle, but Jesus insisted on walking, he and the young disciples heading the procession. In about an hour they reached the vast circular enclosure wherein stood Menser's dwelling and its dependencies, and around which, in lieu of walls, was stretched white tent cloth. Under the triumphal arch before the entrance, Jesus and the disciples were met by a troop of maidens in festive attire. They came forward, two by two, carrying baskets of flowers which they strewed over the way by which he had to pass until it was entirely covered with them. The path led through an avenue of shade trees whose top branches were bound together. The maidens wore under their upper garment which fell around them in the form of a mantle, wide white pantalets, on their feet, pointed sandals, around their heads, bands of some kind of white stuff, and on their arms and breasts and around their necks were wreaths of flowers, wool, and glistening feathers. They were clothed very modestly, though they wore no veils. The shady avenue ended at a covered bridge which led across the moat, or brook, into the large garden around which the brook ran. In front of the bridge was erected a highly ornamented triumphal arch, under which Jesus was received by five priests in white mantles with long trains. Their robes were richly adorned with lace, and from the right arm of each hung a maniple to the ground. They wore on their head a scalloped crown in the front of which was a little shield in the form of a heart, and from which rose a point. Two of them bore a firepan of gold, upon which they sprinkled frankincense from a golden vessel shaped like a boat. They would not allow the trains of their mantles to be held up in Jesus' presence, but tucked them up in a loop behind. The magnificent garden was watered by many little streams and laid off in triangular flowerbeds by paths beautifully paved with ornamental stones. Through the center of it ran an embowered walk, likewise paved with colored stones and figures, to a second covered bridge. The trees and garden bushes were trained in all kinds of figures. I saw some cut to represent men and animals. The outside row was formed of high trees, but the inner ones were smaller, more delicate, and there were many shady resting places. The second bridge once crossed, the way led to the middle of a large, circular place that formed the center of the surrounding enclosure. There on a mound entirely surrounded by water stood, over a well, an open edifice, like a little temple. The roof, formed of skins, was raised upon slender pillars. The whole island was one lovely garden, and opposite to it rose the large royal tent. 
When Jesus crossed the second bridge, he was received by youths playing on flutes and tambourines. They dwelt near the bridge in low, four-cornered tents which stretched right and left in arches. They must have been a kind of bodyguard, for they carried short swords and stood on guard. They wore caps garnished with something like a feather horn, and they had many kinds of ornaments hanging around them, among them the representation of a large half-moon, in which was a face regularly cut out. The procession halted before the little island of the well. The king dismounted from his camel and led Jesus and the disciples to the fountain, which consisted of a wellspring with many circles of jets one above another, all made of shining metal. When a faucet was turned, the streams of water spouted far around and ran down the mound in channels, through the green hedges, and into the surrounding brook. All around the fountain were seats. The disciples washed Jesus' feet, and he theirs. A covered tent avenue ran over the bridge from the fountain to the other side of the great, circular place, and up to Menser and Theokino's tent castle. On one side of the tent castle stood, in the spacious enclosure around the fountain island, the temple, a four-cornered pyramid. It was not so high as the tent castle and was surrounded by a colonnade, in which was found the entrance to the vaults of the deceased kings. Around the temple pyramid ran a flight of spiral steps up to the graded summit. Between the temple and the fountain island, the sacred fire was preserved in a pit covered by a metallic dome upon which was a figure with a little flag in its hand. The fire was kept constantly burning. It was a white flame that did not rise above the mouth of the pit. The priests frequently put into it pieces of something that they dug out of the ground. The tent castle of the kings was several stories high. The lowest, that is, the one next above the solid foundation, was merely graded, so that one could see quite through it. It was full of little bushes and plants, and served as a garden for Theokino, who could no longer walk covered steps and galleries ran around the tent castle from the ground up to the top. Here and there were openings like windows, though not symmetrically placed. The roof of the tent had several gables, all ornamented with flags, stars, and moons. After a short time spent at the fountain, Jesus was escorted through the covered tent avenue to the castle and into the large octagonal hall. In the center rose a supporting column all around which, one above another, were little circular cavities in which various objects could be placed. The walls were hung with colored tapestry upon which were representations of flowers, and figures of boys holding drinking cups, and the floor was carpeted. Jesus requested Menser to conduct him at once to Theokino, whose rooms were in the trellis basement near the little garden. He was resting on a cushioned couch, and he took part in the meal that was served up in dishes of surpassing beauty. The viands were prepared very elegantly. Herbs, fine and delicate, were arranged on the plates to represent little gardens. The cups were of gold. Among the fruits was one particularly remarkable. It was yellow, ribbed, very large, and crowned by a tuft of leaves. The honeycombs were especially fine. Jesus ate only some bread and fruit, and drank from a cup that had never before been used. This was the first time that I saw him eating with pagans. I saw him teaching here whole days at a time, and but seldom taking a mouthful. He taught during that meal and, at last, told his hosts that he was not an envoy of the Messiah, but the Messiah himself. On hearing this, they fell prostrate on the ground in tears. Mensa especially wept with emotion. He could not contain himself for love and reverence, and was unable to conceive how Jesus could have condescended to come to him. But Jesus told him that he had come for the heathens as well as for the Jews, that he was come for all who believed in him. Then they asked him whether it was not time for them to abandon their country, and follow him at once to Galilee, for, as they assured him, they were ready to do so. But Jesus replied that his kingdom was not of this world, and that they would be scandalized, that they would waver in faith if they should see how he would be scorned and maltreated by the Jews. These words they could not comprehend, and they inquired how it could be that things could go so well with the bad while the good had to suffer so much. Jesus then explained to them that they who enjoy on earth have to render an account hereafter, and that this life is one of penance. The kings had some knowledge of Abraham and David, and when Jesus spoke of his ancestors, they produced some old books and searched in them, to see whether they too could not claim descent from the same race. The books were in the form of tablets opening out in a zigzag form, like sample patterns. 
these pagans were so childlike, so desirous of doing all that they were told. They knew that circumcision had been prescribed to Abraham, and they asked the Lord whether they too should obey this part of the law. Jesus answered that it was no longer necessary, that they had already circumcised their evil inclinations, and that they would do so still more. Then they told him that they knew something of Melchizedek and his sacrifice of bread and wine, and said that they too had a sacrifice of the same kind, namely, a sacrifice of little leaves and some kind of a green liquor. When they offered it they spoke some words like these, Whoever eats me and is devout shall have all kinds of felicity. Jesus told them that Melchizedek's sacrifice was a type of the most holy sacrifice, and that he himself was the victim. Thus, though plunged in darkness, these pagans had preserved many forms of truth. Either the night that preceded Jesus' coming or that which followed, I cannot now say which, all the paths and avenues to a great distance around the tent castle were brilliantly illuminated. Transparent globes with lights in them were raised on poles, and every globe was surmounted by a little crown that glistened like a star. The Lord's first visit to the temple of the kings took place by day, and he was escorted to it from the tent castle by the priests in solemn procession. They now wore high caps. From one shoulder depended ribbons with numbers of silver shields, and from the opposite arm hung the long maniple. The whole way to the temple was hung with drapery, and the priests walked barefoot. Here and there in the neighborhood of the temple, women were sitting, anxious to see the Lord. They had little parasols, little canopies on poles, to shade them from the sun. When Jesus passed in the distance, they arose and bowed low to the ground. In the center of the temple rose a pillar from which chevrons extended to the four walls, and from the highest point was suspended a wheel covered with stars and globes, which was used during the religious ceremonies. The priests showed Jesus a representation of the crib which, after their return from Bethlehem, they had caused to be made. It was exactly like that which they had seen in the star, entirely of gold, and surrounded by a plate of the same metal in the form of a star. The little child, likewise of gold, was sitting in a crib like that of Bethlehem, on a red cover. Its hands were crossed on its breast up to which from the feet it was swathed. Even the straw of the manger was represented. Behind the child's head was a little white crown, but I do not now know of what it was made. Besides this crib there was no other image in the temple. A long roll, or tablet, was hanging on the wall. It was the sacred writings, and the letters were principally formed of symbolical figures. Between the pillar and the crib stood a little altar with openings in the sides, and they sprinkled water around with a little brush, as we do holy water. I saw also a consecrated branch with which they performed all kinds of ceremonies, some little round loaves, a chalice, and a plate of the flesh of victims sacrificed. As they were showing all these things to Jesus, he enlightened them on the truth and refuted the reasons they advanced for their use. They took him also to the tombs of King Sir and his family, which lay in the vaults in the covered way that surrounded the pyramidal temple. They looked like couches cut in the wall. The bodies lay in long, white garments, and beautiful covers hung down from their resting places. I saw their half-covered faces and their hands bare and white as snow, but I know not whether it was only their bones or whether they were still covered with dried skin, for I saw that the hands were deeply furrowed. This sepulchral vault was quite habitable, and there was a stool in each of the tombs. The priests brought in fire and burnt incense. All shed tears, especially the aged King Menser, who wept like a child. Jesus approached the remains and spoke of the dead. Theokino, speaking to Jesus of Sir, told him that a dove was frequently seen to alight on the branch which, according to their custom, they stuck on the door of his tomb, and he asked what it meant. Jesus in reply asked him what was Sir's belief. To this Theokino answered, Lord, his faith was like unto mine. After we began to honor the king of the Jews, Sir up to his death desired that all he thought and did, all that was to befall him, might ever be in accordance with the will of that king. Thereupon Jesus informed him that the dove on the branch signified that Sir had been baptized with the baptism of desire. Jesus drew for them on a plate the figure of the lamb resting on the book with the seven seals, a little standard over its shoulder, and he bade them make one on that model and place it on the column opposite the crib. Since their return from Bethlehem, 
the kings had every year celebrated a memorial feast of three days in honor of that upon which, fifteen years before the birth of Christ, they had for the first time seen the star containing the picture of the virgin who held in one hand a scepter, and in the other a balance with an ear of wheat in one dish and a cluster of grapes in the other. The three days were in honor of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. They reverenced Saint Joseph in a special manner, because he had received them so kindly and graciously. It was now time for this annual festival, but in their humility in presence of the Lord, they wanted to omit the usual religious ceremonies, and begged him to give them an instruction instead. But Jesus told them that they must celebrate their feast, lest the people in their ignorance of what had just taken place might be scandalized at the omission. I saw many things connected with their religion. They had three images in the form of animals standing around outside the temple. One was a dragon with huge jaws another a dog with a great head, and the third was a bird with legs and neck long, almost like a stork, only that it had a peaked bill. I do not think that these images were adored as gods. They served only as symbols of certain virtues whose practice they inculcated. The dragon represented the bad, the dark principle in man's nature, which he must labor to destroy. The dog, which had reference to some star, signified fidelity, gratitude, and vigilance and the bird typified filial love. The images embodied besides all kinds of deep, profound mysteries, but I cannot now recall them. I know well, however, that no idolatry, no abomination was connected with them. They were embodiments of great wisdom and humility, of deep meditation upon the wonderful things of God. They were not made of gold, but of something darker, like those fragments that were used for smelting the ore, or perhaps what remained after that process. Below the figure of the dragon I read five letters, A-A-S-C-C -C or A-S-C-A-S, -A -S. I do not remember exactly which. The dog's name was Sir, but that of the bird I have forgotten. The four priests delivered discourses in four different places around the temple before the men, the women, the maidens, and the youths. I saw them open the dragon's jaws and I heard them say at the same time, If, hateful and frightful as he is, he were now alive and about to devour us, who alone could help us but the Almighty God. And they gave to God some special name that I cannot now recall. Then they caused the wheel to be taken down from its place, put it on the altar in a track formed to receive it, and one of the priests made it revolve. There were several circles one inside the other all hung with hollow golden balls, which glittered and tinkled at every revolution, thus announcing the course of the constellations. This revolving of the wheel was accompanied by singing, the refrain being to this effect, what would become of the world if God should cease to direct the movement of the stars. This was followed by the offering of sacrifice before the golden Christ child in the crib, and the burning of incense. Jesus commanded them to do away with those animals for the future, and to teach mercy, love of the neighbor, and the redemption of the human race. As for the rest, they should admire God and his creatures, give him thanks, and adore him alone. On the evening of the first of these three festivals, the Sabbath began for Jesus. Therefore, he withdrew with the three youths into a retired apartment of the tent castle to celebrate it. They had with them white garments, almost like grave clothes. These they put on, along with a girdle, ornamented with letters and straps, which they crossed like a stole over the brave saint on a table covered with red and white stood a lamp with seven burners. When in prayer, Jesus stood between two of the youths, the third behind him. No pagan was present at Jesus' celebration of the Sabbath. During the whole of the Sabbath, the pagans were gathered together in the enclosure around their temple. Men, women, youths, and maidens all had their respective tiers of seats. After Jesus had finished his celebration of the Sabbath, he went out to the pagans and then I witnessed a wonderful scene. In the center of the women's circle stood the image of the dragon. The women were very differently clothed according to their rank. The poorest wore under their long mantles only a short garment, very simple, but the more distinguished were arrayed like her whom I now saw step in front of the dragon. She was a robust-looking woman of about thirty. Under the long mantle, which she laid aside when seated, she wore a stiff, plated tunic and a jacket very closely fitting around the neck and breast, and ornamented with glittering jewels and tiny chains. From the shoulder to the elbow hung lappets like open half-sleeves, and the rest of the arms, like the lower limbs, was covered with lace and bracelets. 
On her head she wore a close-fitting cap that reached down to the eyes, partly concealed the cheeks and chin, and which was formed entirely of rows of curled feathers. Above the middle of the head, bent from the forehead back, arose a kind of roll or pad through which could be seen the hair, braided and ornamented. A great many long ornamental chains were pendant from the ears down to the brave saint before the priest began his instruction. The woman, attended by many others, went in front of the dragon, cast herself down and kissed the earth. She performed this action with marked enthusiasm and devotion. At this moment Jesus stepped into the middle of the circle and asked why she did that. She answered that the dragon awoke her every morning before day when she arose, turned toward the quarter in which the image stood, prostrated before her couch, and adored it. Jesus next asked, Why dost thou cast thyself down before Satan? Thy faith has been taken possession of by Satan. It is true indeed that thou wilt be awakened, but not by Satan. It is an angel that will awake thee. Behold whom thou adore saint at the same moment, there stood by the woman, and in sight of all present, a spirit in the form of a figure lank and reddish, with a sharp, hideous countenance. The woman shrank back in fright. Jesus, pointing to the spirit, said, This is he that has been accustomed to awake thee. But every human being has also a good angel. Prostrate before him and follow his advice. At these words of Jesus, all perceived a beautiful luminous figure hovering near the woman. Tremblingly she prostrated before him. So long as Satan stood beside the woman, the good angel remained behind her. But when he disappeared, the angel came forward. The woman, deeply affected, now returned to her place. She was called Cups. She was afterward baptized Serena by Thomas, under which name she was later on martyred and venerated as a saint. In his instruction to the youths and maidens who were assembled in the vicinity of the bird, Jesus warned them to observe due measure in their love of both human beings and the lower animals, for there were some among them that almost adored their parents, and others that showed more affection for animals than for their fellow men. On the last day of the festival, Jesus desired to deliver a discourse in the temple to the priests and kings and all the people. That the aged king Theokino also might be among his hearers, Jesus went to him with Menser and commanded him to rise and accompany him. He took him by the hand and Theokino, nothing doubting, rose up at once able to walk. Jesus led him to the temple and from that time forward he retained the use of his limbs. Jesus ordered the doors of the pyramidal temple to be opened that all the people outside could both see and hear him. He taught sometimes outside among the men and women, the youths, the maidens, and the children, relating to them many of the parables that he had formerly recounted to the Jews. His auditors were privileged to interrupt him in order to ask questions, for he had commanded them to do so. Sometimes also he called upon a certain one to say aloud before all the others the doubts that troubled him, for he knew the thoughts of everyone. Among the questions they asked was this, why he raised no dead to life, cured no sick, as the king of the Jews had done? Jesus answered that he did not perform such miracles among pagans, but that he would send some men who would work many wonders among them, and that through the bath of baptism they should become clean. They should, he said, until that time take his words on faith. Jesus then gave an instruction to the priests and kings alone. He told them that whatever in their doctrine bore an appearance of truth, was a mere lie, it had only the semblance, the empty form of truth, and the demon himself gave it that form. As soon as the good angel withdraws, Satan steps forward, corrupts worship, and takes it under his own guardianship. Heretofore, Jesus continued, they had honored all those objects to which they could attach some idea of strength, and of that worship they had omitted many things after their return from Bethlehem. Now, however, he told them they should do away with those figures of animals, should melt them down, and he indicated to them the people to whom their value should be given. All their worship, all their knowledge, he said, valued nothing. They should inculcate love and mercy without the aid of those images, and thank the Father in heaven that he had so mercifully called them to the knowledge of himself. Jesus promised them that he would send one who would more fully instruct them, and he directed them to remove the wheel with its starry representations. It was as large as a carriage wheel of moderate size and had seven concentric rims, on the uppermost and the lowest of which were fastened globes from which streamed rays. The central point consisted of a larger globe, which represented the earth. 
on the circumference of the wheel were twelve stars, in which were as many different pictures, splendid and glittering. I saw among them one of a virgin with rays of light flashing from her eyes and playing around her mouth, while on her forehead sparkled precious stones, and another of an animal with something in its mouth that emitted sparks. But I could not see all distinctly, because the wheel was constantly revolving. The figures were not all visible at the same time, for at intervals some were hidden. Jesus desired to leave them some bread and wine blessed by himself. The priest had, in obedience to his directions, prepared some very fine white bread like little cakes, and a small jug of some kind of red liquor. Jesus specified the shape of the vessel in which all was to be preserved. It was like a large mortar. It had two ears, a cover with a knob, and was divided into two compartments. The bread was deposited in the upper one, and in the lower one, in which there was a small door, the little jug of liquor was placed. The outside shone like quicksilver, but the inside was yellow. Jesus placed the bread and the wine on the little altar prayed, and blessed, while the priests and the two kings knelt before him, their hands crossed on their brace Saint Jesus prayed over them, laid his hands on their shoulders, and instructed them how they should renew the bread, which he cut for them crosswise, giving them the words and the ceremony of benediction. This bread and wine were to be for them a symbol of holy communion. The kings had some knowledge of Melchizedek, and they questioned Jesus concerning his sacrifice. When he blessed the bread for them, he gave them some idea of his passion and of the Last Supper. They should, he told them, make use of the bread and wine for the first time on the anniversary of their adoration at the crib, and after that three times in the year, or every three months, I cannot recall it exactly. Next day Jesus again taught in the temple wherein all were gathered. He went in and out, leaving one crowd to go to another. He allowed the women and children also to come and speak to him, and he instructed the mothers how to rear their children and teach them to pray. This was the first time that I saw many children gathered together here. The boys wore only a short tunic, and the little girls, mantles. The children of the converted lady were present. She was a person of distinction and her spouse, a tall man, was near King Menser. She had fully ten children with her. Jesus blessed them, laying his hand not on the head as he did to the children of Judea, but on the shoulder. He instructed the people upon his mission and his approaching end, and told them that his journey into their country was unknown to the Jews. He had, he said, brought with him as companions youths that would take no scandal at what they saw and heard, and who were docile to all his words. The Jews would have taken his life, had he not made his escape. But apart from all that, he was desirous of visiting them because they had visited him, had believed in him, hoped in him, and loved him. He admonished them to thank God for not allowing them to be entirely blinded by idolatry, and for giving them the true belief in himself, and the grace to keep his commandments. If I do not mistake, he spoke to them also of the time of his return to his heavenly Father, when he would send to them his disciples. He told them too that he was going down into Egypt where as a child he had been with his mother, for there were some people there who had known him in his childhood. He would, however, remain quite unknown, as there were Jews there who would willingly seize him and deliver him to his enemies. But his time was not yet come. The pagans could not understand the human foresight of Jesus. In their childlike simplicity, they mentally asked themselves, how could they do such things to him, since he is truly God? Jesus answered their thoughts by telling them that he was man also, that the Father had sent him to lead back all the scattered, that as a man, he could suffer and be persecuted by men when his hour would have come, and because he was a man, he could be thus intimate with them. He warned them again to renounce all kinds of idolatry, and to love one another. In speaking of his own passion, he touched upon true compassion. They should, he said, desist from their excessive care of sick animals, and turn their love toward their fellow beings both as regards body and soul, and if there were in their neighborhood none that stood in need of assistance, they should seek at a distance for such as did, and pray for all their destitute brethren. He told them also that what they did for the needy, they did for him, and he made them understand that they were not to treat the lower animals with cruelty. They had entire tents filled with sick animals of all kinds, which they even provided with little beds. They were especially fond of dogs, of which I saw many large ones with enormous heads. 
Prayer for the Intercession of Blessed and Catherine Emmerich O Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, devout and pious follower of Christ, who patiently endured the frailty of this mortal condition, who humbly received the honorable marks of Christ Jesus on your hands, feet, side, head, and chest, the marks which you were blessed by the Lord to witness for yourself in his own sufferings, we graciously ask for your intercession with God that we sinners may be forgiven of our sins and be drawn more completely into spiritual communion with Christ our Lord. We ask this in the name of the Most Holy Lamb of God and through the intercession of Holy Mary, our Mother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, pray for us.